here's what you're, what you're looking at here um, on, on this particular slide. And I'm going to erase my board while I'm talking to you. So what you're, you should be looking at are a bunch of orange boxes. And so what you see on the top there is you see um, a couple of different chemicals. There's phospholipase A2, which is PLA2. We just abbreviated as PLA2. This chemical, and then you see another chemical on the other side called COX enzyme. So those two things, when your cell breaks open, when there's cell damage, you'll see a box on the left that says cell damage. So when your cell gets damaged, what happens, you get cell damage, and that releases a compound called AA. Okay, now arachidonic acid or AA, the COX enzyme kind of gets together with that arachidonic acid and then together what they do is they create inflammation. All right, again, I'm just trying to make this as simple as possible as I can for you. If you look at phospholipase A2, it also acts on, on, on the same area and it can create again and a release uh, of inflammatory mediators, potentially, or not potentially, but the big chemical that gets released is PGE2, prostaglandin E2. It's just a type of chemical that is produced inside your cells as they're damaged and as those enzymes take effect on them. So the out outcome of having PGE2, so what happens is PGE2 stimulates fever, it stimulates pain, Okay, and it increases antibody production. So again, just trying to show you this diagram so that you kind of, I drew a picture of it earlier, but it was a little bit more confusing than I wanted it to be. So just trying to make it more simple and easier looking for you. Now, once that happens, so this is what we call acute inflammation. Acute inflammation is the part of inflammation when the damage is initially done. And this is where people get into trouble in the hospitals. It's not chronic inflammation with this illness. It's acute inflammation, pneumonia, and, and, and inflammation that occurs in the lungs. It's that acute inflammation that releases, right? All, all this prostaglandin is released. It leads to uh, an, a, kind of an opening of the barriers in the lungs so that things become more permeable and fluid in blood and, and uh, cytokines and other things that your immune system sends in there to fight. Are, are flooding in. And so we get this acute inflammatory response, which is this really heightened inflammation. And with that heightened inflammation, over to the, you know, if it's acutely, it's got to happen. So we kind of want that acute inflammation because after acute inflammation, we get healing. So if we block the acute aspect of inflammation altogether, then it also can actually potentially slow down the healing process. And that's really what I want you to understand. Now, again, if you're in the hospital and you need to block acute inflammation to save your life, that's one thing. But if you're at home and, and how can we start to apply this? Let me show you the next slide because I want to show you, um, okay, where. So now what you're looking at is you're looking at a slide here and you see that PLA2 enzyme. You see a big black X on it and you'll see that steroids and quercetin. So this is where one of the mechanisms of action of how steroids block inflammation is when you're when you have damage, this enzyme PLA2 is blocked by steroids. And so that stops the inflammatory damage from persisting and going on. But again, long term steroids also inhibit the healing process. You'll also see there, though, underneath steroids, you'll see something called quercetin. So quercetin is a bioflavonoid. It's a plant-based product or plant-based chemical that has anti-inflammatory properties on that enzyme. And so it, it, it just doesn't have them. It's not like you can't put one gram to one steroid gram together and, and compare them because the steroid is going to work a lot more aggressively than the quercetin, but the quercetin can have a very nice anti-inflammatory effect if you're taking it prophylactically there's actually research studies that show quercetin has antiviral properties quercetin actually can reduce the risk of developing um, upper airway diseases upper upper uh, respiratory tract infections and things of that nature so i'm just what i'm trying to do is show you kind of how we can think about uh, fevers and how the mechanism behind how fevers work. So if you look again, let's go to the next one because that next slide, yeah. So now you see that quercetin also blocks the cyclooxygenase enzyme. So quercetin, again, I was, I was talking earlier about how NSAIDs could block this enzyme, that COX enzyme, and now we're showing you that quercetin can also block it. 
And, and the reason I'm showing that to you is because quercetin can block it, but quercetin can block it not quite as aggressively, but without interfering with the healing phase after the acute inflammatory phase is over. So that's, that's one of the benefits of having quercetin or using quercetin. And that's why a lot of scientists are focusing in on quercetin as a potential uh, for COVID-19. It's, it's no, there's no research studies that have been done, but there's some major studies that are getting ready to be approved and launched on the use of, quer of quercetin. So now I would not recommend quercetin to, if you go to my board, I wouldn't recommend quercetin to block the COX enzyme to reduce a fever because it doesn't work quite that way. Quercetin is one of those things when you have high levels of it in your system for longer periods of time, it can be very, very helpful at modulating inflammation, but it's not something that's gonna give you, if you have an acute fever of 105, it's not something that's gonna take that fever of 105 and push it down to 103 or 102. So, so quercetin is not gonna have that acute fever reducing capacity, but it is going to have that uh, that overall reduction in overall inflammatory capacity. And why do we want to know about this as it relates to any virus? Well, the research shows that quercetin, but through its effect on inflama inflammatory modulation, doesn't just modulate inflammation. It also it can inhibit viral replication in, in, in multiple different areas. And I'll show you some information on that in just a minute. But quercetin, very, very powerful as a nutrient in regards to immune function. So a lot of you have asked me, uh, we've been getting this all week because vitamin C is very scarce right now. So a lot of you have been writing in and asking Dr. Osmond, what can I use if I wanna support my immune system right now? What can I use instead of vitamin C? I just can't find any vitamin C. Well, one of the things you can use is quercetin. Quercetin is, is very, very good at a lot of the things that vitamin C is good at. And because of it's also, because of its antiviral properties, it's actually been studied to be antiviral against the rhinovirus against influenza, against the hepatitis virus, against Ebola virus. So there are a number of research studies that show that quercetin has very potent antiviral effects. And so I wanted to share that with you because again, that question keeps coming in. So I wanna back up just a minute because I got, I got too far ahead of where I wanted to go. So uh, take me back up to, oh, maybe down further, I'm sorry. Yeah, so let's yeah, let's just throw that that next slide up. Quercetin research antiviral properties. So let's let's just dive into it. I'm gonna come back to the fever and why whether because some of you have probably got the question in your head, well, what about Tylenol? We're gonna come back to that in just a minute. So quercetin has a number of, of researched antiviral properties. So the slide, I'm gonna pop this slide up on the big screen for you. You can you can see this, but uh, in this particular study, the Journal of Infectious Diseases and Preventative Medicine. You can see that uh, recent research, you know, points to uh, flavanol antioxidant quercetin as having therapeutic properties. Quercetin has been shown to reduce viral uh, internalization. That means it stops, helps to stop the virus from getting into the cell, as well as in reducing viral replication in vitro. What does that mean? That means these studies are not done in the human body. They're more done in kind of in a petri dish effect. Uh, and so I want to be very, very clear about what these studies are showing. And so, but also reducing viral load and lung inflammation in the airways in hyper response to people who are hyper responsive in vivo. So what does in vivo mean? Means in vivo means study in the body. Okay. So quercetin has been researched both in the Petri dish, but it's also been researched in human and actual humans to reduce okay, to reduce the aggressive inflammation in hypersensitive individuals. Now, again, this has not been studied in COVID, so don't, I want to be very, very clear with my disclaimer. I don't want any of you thinking that what I'm telling you to do is just to go take a bunch of quercetin and that's going to treat your COVID. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, is that research has shown that quercetin has a, a reduction property in inflammation Okay, and in, this, in these studies, in some of these studies, we're talking more about influenza and rhinovirus, uh, but it reduces the inflammation in the lungs to people who have hypersensitive responses to the pneumonia. So again, it's helping to reduce that inflammation in those hyper-responsive patients. Well, those are the ones that we're worried about, right? The people that are overreacting. So again, 
I, I'm showing you this to show you that there's a potential mechanism. And again, it hasn't been studied in COVID-19, but there's a potential viral, antiviral mechanism and anti-inflammatory mechanism that quercetin has already shown in both human studies and in vitro studies to be a very, very powerful mechanism at reduction of inflammation. So let's, let's now go to the next slide. So this is actually taken from, uh, from the same article. So you can see that in, in, there are different things. This, this, basically what this picture is showing you is that quercetin, it, does, it has multiple effects, right? So number one, it inhibits viral replication at various stages. Number two, it blocks endocytosis. What does that word mean? That means it blocks the ability for the virus to get into the cell. So it blocks that from happening. But number three, it increases the viral clearance by enhancing mitochondria antiviral responses. So when you add all of that together, it also creates an, uh, a reduced pro-inflammatory uh, component. So in essence, it reduces uh, the inflammatory aspect of how the virus could potentially impact or affect somebody. So again, this is coming out of, uh, of research studies. I'm showing you already studied benefits of quercetin, although not on COVID-19, but on other forms of viral infections. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.